Well, we need to uh, proceed then with the afternoon session. We will have uh, two plenary talks, and then we will uh, break into discussion groups in terms of the synthesis uh, program that we have following that. The uh, first plenary speaker will be introduced by uh, Robert Hoffman, who's the co-chair of the meeting. Bob? The first of our plenary speakers is, I suspect, very well known to most of you. He comes from Harvard University, where he is uh, said to hold appointments in three different departments. Most of us have our hands full with just one chairman. He is a prolific writer. Uh, he produces a monthly column for Natural History, the popular magazine of the American Museum of Natural History, and he is the author of many books, such as Ontogeny and Phylogeny, The Mismeasure of Man. My own favorites are The Panda's Thumb and The Flamingo's Smile. There's even a book set within this museum, Wonderful Life, which is the story of Charles Walcott and his work with the Burgess Shale and its famous fauna. Walcott was both a famous paleontologist and in the early 20th century was the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. This was at a time when scientists were still deemed to be suitable leaders for museums like this. <laughs> Steve has received many awards in recognition of his scholarly achievements, such as the MacArthur Fellowship, the National Book Award, past president of AAAS, and so forth. Today, he brings this scholarship to bear on the topic of his plenary lecture, Evolution and the 21st Century. Professor Gould. It's, it's funny, Bob. Oh, can you get those lights off me? I don't have slides, so why don't we just put the lights on throughout the hall? And anybody else takes my picture, they're going to die. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll pose for you later, okay? But if I, light, light in my eyes, it just knocks me out, okay? Please, thank you. Bob completely missed the strategy of being in three departments. It's not so you have to serve three chairmen. It's so you have to serve none of them. The whole point is <laughs> whenever you ask to do anything, you say, oh, but you see, I'm really primarily in one of the others. It's, it really works. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't served on a committee in 20 years. That's where I find time to write. <laughs> I always tell my students that the one advantage to being an American with respect to Darwin and his legacy is it's very easy to remember his birthday. Put the camera away. I really meant it. <laughs> Thank you. That it's very easy to remember Darwin's birthday if you're an American because he was born on Lincoln's birthday or vice versa. As I'm sure you all know, not just the same day, but the same date, February 12, 1809. And he published The Origin of Species in 1859 when he was 50 years old. Because of that, Darwinian celebrations have a double whammy and they come along at predictable moments. There was enormous set of celebrations in 1909 to celebrate the 100th anniversary of his birth and the 50th of the origin. And then in 1959, many of them featuring Ernst as a leading speaker, was the 100th anniversary of the origin of species. And only philatelists know this word. I was once one. The sesquicentenary of the 150th anniversary of his birth. Now, it's very interesting to contrast those two. And it's been done often before because they represent such interesting times and conflicting times in the uh, makeup and history of evolutionary theory. I've got to pull out some props, which we'll get to later, but I need one now, which will emerge somewhere from these. There it is. See it? Now, 1909 was a happy time for the acceptability of evolution as a fact. That's how Darwin got in Westminster Abbey after all, but with respect to acceptance of the theory of natural selection or of any theory, it was a fairly confusing and distressing time. 
Vernon Kellogg, great American biologist, collaborated with David Starr Jordan, wrote one of the finest books in the history of evolutionary theory in 1907 called Darwinism Today, which is one long commentary on the confusion among various contenders for evolutionary mechanics. And he points out there are three major opponents of Darwinian natural selection, which is clearly a minority opinion, with respect to its importance. There's no one doubted that selection was a true force, but most biologists at that point saw it as a minor negative force that could only eliminate the unfit. The fit would have to arise by some other mechanism. The three alternatives that Kellogg discusses are Lamarckism, orthogenesis, and various forms of saltationism. He starts the book by talking about a German volume called the Sterbelage, the deathbed of Darwinism. It was translated into English in 1904. Lovely uh, Art Nouveau cover, could have come from Rennie McIntosh. And I just read you one passage, which is characteristic of the confusion at that time. A majority, this is a book by many German scientists arguing that, yeah, evolution is true, but Darwinism is effectively dead. My object in these pages, says the author, is to show that Darwinism will soon be a thing of the past, a matter of history that we even now stand at its deathbed, the Sterbelager, while its friends are solicitous only to secure for it a decent burial. Well, that was perhaps overstated. But in the major symposium of 1909, which was held in England, Hooker and uh, Wallace were still alive, two members of Darwin's inner circle. Let me read you what Wallace said in an article of that year. Here's the strictest of Darwinians someone who out Darwin Darwin in his commitment to natural selection, but still fairly unhappy about the current circumstance. He says, during the 50 years, this is Alfred Russell Wallace, 1910, published the year after. During the 50 years that have elapsed since the Darwinian theory was first adequately, though not exhaustively, set forth, it has been subject to more than the usual amount of objection and misapprehension, both by ignorant and learned critics, by old-fashioned field naturalists, and by the newer schools of physiological specialists. Now, by 1959, everything had changed. That was a time of ironic ecumenicism. People were falling over each other to agree on the version that uh, Anson and his colleagues made, one of the great achievements of 20th century science, the modern synthesis. My own opinion is that it went a little bit too far in the other direction, in the joy of agreement. I don't think it was quite so neat as something G.G. Simpson said at the time when he wrote, this general theory, this aesthetic theory, is now supported by an imposing array of paleontologists, geneticists, and other biological specialists. That's true. Differences of opinion on relatively minor points naturally persist, and many details remain to be filled in, but the essentials of the explanation of the history of life have probably now been achieved. I think that was a little over-optimistic, though a certainly better position than 1909. Interestingly, 1982, which is the 100th anniversary of Darwin's death, was a yet another, you know, homo sapiens will take any excuse for celebration. <laughs> that was a more interesting time, and uh, I remember going my, myself at that point to some of those celebrations, and there you had the, the happiest circumstance of a wellspring of agreement, which persists to this day about basic... Darwinian mechanisms, but the beginning of some rumblings about some interesting additions, modifications, expansions, changes in the basis of evolutionary theory that indicates that maybe it wasn't just what Simpson had said, just a few details to be filled in. And I want to focus this talk on some things that have happened between then and now. It's not even 20 years, but this field of ours is in remarkably good shape as illustrated by how much has happened even in that short period of time, as we look towards 2009, the 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth, and the sesquicentenary of the origin of species, when, again, we will have many celebrations, and I expect Ants to give at least an hour-long talk <laughs> at that time. Uh, we're not in the prediction business. That's exactly what uh, evolutionary biology is about. So I'm not going to tell you where we're going to be at in 2009, moreover through the 21st century, but let me lay out where I think we are and what's interesting. Let me take five minutes talking about a subject that's on everyone's mind, but it really shouldn't be our primary focus here, but I can't not talk about it, and that is issues of public understanding of evolution with respect to creationism, definitely not my topic today. You all know the famous story of the English lady who, upon hearing about Mr. Darwin's achievement, is said to have remarked that she hoped that it wasn't true, 
but that if it was true, she certainly hoped that it would not become generally known. Now, she, you know, she's usually laughed at because it's such a wonderful notion that the British upper classes could keep to themselves and away from the rabble rouses of lower social orders as fundamental truth of nature. And so we tend to laugh at this lady's pretensions, and yet in a funny sense she was a prophet. We ought to honor her. Indeed, what Mr. Darwin said is true, and indeed it has not become generally known, at least in the United States. <laughs> Nonetheless, with respect to public understanding, and particularly creationism, I really am more optimistic than some, some of you, I think. And I want to just briefly sketch some of those reasons I'll get off this topic. First of all, as we all understand, much as we are distressed by this issue, it is in the Western world only an American movement. It's hard to figure out how such a notion could even arise anywhere else in the Western world. It's not going to arise in any Catholic country where there's no tradition for biblical literalism since St. Augustine, and not much tradition for Bible reading at all, since it only comes out of biblical literalism. It's never going to arise in Jewish traditions where most of the Orthodox believe that not one jot nor tittle of the text can ever be changed. But that doesn't mean you know what it means. <laughs> text is inviolate, then you argue about what it means. I mean, it's only going to arise within a nation as pluralistically Protestant as the United States. Of course, the vast majority of Protestants, uh, well, that's probably most of you anyway, agree with the consensus, of course, because it's not a science versus religion issue. There aren't any such issues, and the vast majority of professional theologians accept evolution as the way of the world and in no way contrary. But it is a movement distinctly American of those minority biblical literalists, whatever that means, since Genesis 1 and 2 tell different stories, that's another issue. And it's just not going to rise anywhere else. I like to say there are three things that Europeans do not understand about this crazy country of ours. One is Bill and Monica, or why we care about it, not why it happens. The second is why we can't get a decent train in the most intense linear population car in the world between Boston and Washington. And the third is why, in heaven's name, in an advanced technological society in the new millennium, there should be a politically potent creationist movement. So it's a problem, but at least it's only our problem. Secondly, <laughs> we have won substantial legal victories every time it comes up. We won in 68 the Epson decision, which got rid of the Scopes era laws, said you couldn't throw evolution out. We won in, a, in a Edwards v. Aguilard, which um, said that you, the Supreme Court said in 1987, which says you can't import this oxymoronic notion of creation science, which is just Genesis literalism and the sheep's clothing of that oxymoron. You can't import that in. You see, that's why Kansas made that decision. This probably will be overturned as soon as they vote that school board out, but just prima facie ridiculous. And obviously so. Why would a school board make a decision if they really want evolution out or creationism in, which is what they want, why would they vote only to make evolution optional instead? Which is patently absurd by their beliefs or anybody's beliefs, like saying we're going to teach English and not teach grammar anymore. You don't have to, which I hear is done in many places in America. But cl clearly the reason they made that decision is the only thing that might pass legal muster. I said they can't throw evolution out, they can't force creationism in. So they are stuck with respect to legal maneuvering. Third, there are all these depressing polls that say if you ask Americans on the street, uh, should we teach just evolution or should we teach both? Vast majority say teach them both. And these assumptions a lot of people make from that is that we live in a nation with an active creationist majority. I'm really confident that that is not so. What it indicates is our problem that we live in a nation where most people are of extreme goodwill, but they don't know much about science. That's our fault because we haven't taught them well. And uh, that's just how Americans are going to react. Uh, that is, they've heard something about a debate about evolution. They don't know anything about it. They have no reason to be hostile to it. They have a vague supposition it might be against religion also. So if you ask them, should we just teach evolution or should we teach both, of course you're going to say, well, that seems the fair thing, teach both. I think that's only a clarion call to us to explain ourselves better. Uh, Mainly, and we should take confidence in this, it is not a conflict between science and religion. There is no conflict between science and religion. If we can get that across, we will prevail. Why do I say that? Because, oh, there's a fourth strange thing about the United States. I'm sure there are many others. Which is that, for some reason that I don't understand, because I don't see an enormous depth of religious practice in this country, among Western nations, we have the highest percentage of people who swear that a belief in, in, on shakable belief in the existence of a supreme being is part of their faith. It's 80 to 90 percent, and I have no reason to impugn that. If that's what people say, I assume it's what they believe. Now, 
We're not going to change that. Why should we try to? But the point is this. If 80 to 90 percent of Americans profess that, whatever they're practicing, and they think that evolution is against religion or that any kind of science is against religion, we're not going to get very far. So uh, the main reason why we have to keep stressing that religion is a different matter and science is not in any sense opposed to it, one's about factuality and theory making for the natural world and the other's about ethics and values and meaning in a spiritual sense. The reason why we support that position is it happens to be right logically, but we should also be aware that it is very practical as well if we want to prevail. Now, last point about that, then I get off it. Um, I'm not totally sanguine though, because although we have our legal successes, although I think there's a path out, the problem is the problem of all Philistinism, of all Yahooism, of all anti-intellectualism. It's what you can't measure. If I may tell a little story, I tell it often. This is why it's dangerous. I'm a, a teacher in a little town. I'm in debt. I've got a big mortgage on my house. I've got three kids. I don't want to move again. Now, I'm a biology teacher. I want to teach evolution. That's how I'm trained. That's what I know I ought to be doing. So I get into classroom. I'm not a particularly courageous person. Most people aren't. Uh, I get into class and there's little Petey in the fourth row and I know that both his parents are very prominent business people and creationists. So I say, you know what, God, I'm sorry. I know I should be teaching this stuff because it's your way of making this world work. But I don't want any trouble this year. Maybe I won't teach it. Maybe I'll teach it a little later. See, that's what you can't measure and that is happening all over the United States. That's what we really have to fight and that is insidious and I don't know the answer to that one. But in a funny sense, I'm almost more distressed not by this strong minority of, create, of active biblical literalists, but by how few people who have no problem with evolution, who accept it, who find it fascinating, who even call themselves Darwinians, really don't understand the full spate of the radical implications of Darwinian theory, which are so captured in two excellent book titles by people I don't usually praise, but I feel very ironic today. And The Blind Watchmaker is a wonderful metaphor in Dawkins' book. And uh, Dennett is absolutely right. Darwin's idea is very dangerous, and that's why we don't understand it very well, is it? Excellently said. Now, here's the, here's the strategy. Right, let me get off that topic now. The strategy for the main part of this talk, I want to sort of look at where we were in 1982 so where we are now and what might be happening as we head to 2009, as I say, I'm not in the prediction business, none of us should be in any broad sense, uh, uh, not going to extend a moment beyond that. There is a shibboleth in most analyses of science which proclaims that the grand goal is integration. We'll know we're really there when all the subfields come together into one grand, glorious, overarching theory and uh, when all aspects of evolution can be so integrated, that will be the sign of maturity. In fact, there's a picture that was even handed out to the speakers of the way in which biology might integrate as a series of levels. That didn't bother me, but I don't think we're going to have it integrate that tightly. It's an old shibboleth. comes out of the unity of science movement. Uh, insofar as certain kinds of unifications can be made, that's always good. But I find sometimes that the grand kinds of unifications that are proposed can only be so because they're so general and abstract that they cease to be very interesting with respect to the details that natural historians are interested in. After all, we have a history of life whose details include such things as why there were dinosaurs then and people now. And that means that these very broad unifications end up often being too exclusionary of the guts of the stuff that fascinates us. I think that preference for overarching unification is more in our heads than in the world. And uh, in this respect, I think very often we need models of respectful separation of mutually reinforcing parts rather than looking for the one grand theory that will be the sign of maturation or completion of the science. science. Let me do a David Letterman style list that goes from four to one. Uh, but it will be decreasing specificity of things that I think maybe shouldn't be joined. Let's start at the broadest. We don't want to join science and religion. There are syncretists out there trying to find uh, Brahma in the Big Bang or the god of, uh, of Christianity in the um, wave-particle duality as Jesus and God. I'm not making this up. <laughs> that was a serious argument at that Berkeley conference couple of years ago. We don't want that. <laughs> These are different disciplines whose mutual respect for each other 
is, I think, the best way to proceed. So that's at the that's number four. Number three, how about science and the humanities? Well, I don't know how much they can be unified. There's certainly an anthropology of aesthetics that's worth studying, but um, and there's certainly a unification in modes of thought and creativity. But I don't want unity of the fields in any sense. The, their logics and their theories cannot coincide in any way. What I want is psychological unity within myself and my own richer life. I want to continue singing in my choruses and doing this kind of stuff. But that's, that doesn't mean I think the fields are integratable in any sense that will specify a higher order harmony of intellectual achievement. Uh, let's go down to now the last two, which are more relevant within evolutionary theory. How about Darwinian biological evolution and human cultural change? which I do not like to call evolution, precisely because if I, talk, if I call it cultural evolution, then the implications are that the Darwinian analog should be more important. And in fact, if anything, I rather suspect, although there of course are some genuine analogies, the disanalogies between Darwinian biological evolution and human cultural change are more important than the legitimate analogies. Now, of course, culture is built on the Darwinian substrate of our common human nature. That's what evolutionary psychology has right. That's obviously right. But that's the common substrate from which culture is constructed. It's not cultural change itself. Uh, problem is that when you look at cultural change and its regularities, it has properties that are so profoundly non-Darwinian in style that the disanalogies have to then overwhelm. I'll give you the two obvious ones, nothing deep in this. Cultural change is Lamarckian. Whatever I learn in one generation, I transmit directly to my offspring. <laughs> No system with that powerful Lamarckian impetus can operate by the Darwinian selection off random variants. It can't. Any Darwinian fact is going to be overwhelmed. If, look, if biology were Lamarckian, then Darwinian, Darwinian evolution wouldn't have been important for the same reason. It's too fast. It's too powerful. It's positive feedback. It runs forward. That's why cultural change is apparently directional sometimes. It's technological aspects. It's also why it falls apart and can be so dangerous, because it has that forward drive, so it's Lamarckian character, this makes it a very different sort of beast. Secondly, it's so fundamental after you get beyond the prokaryotes that the topology of biological evolution is one of continuous branching, and that once a lineage becomes separate, though it may interact ecologically with others, it is a separate entity forever. That slows down a lot and differentiates. The watchword of human cultural change is the anastomosis of lineages through cultural borrowing. If you want a biological analog, I'm sure that infection will work better than evolution. Uh, it's just a different kind of process. There are similarities, but they're likely to be in that very broadly overarching domain in which all change that has genealogical constraints is going to have some similarities. I'm not sure it's really useful. I think probably we should be emphasizing and studying the differences. I think in studying the differences, we can, be, we can learn a lot about human cultural change. In that sense, understanding biological change and why it's different is very useful. And then we come to the last, number one, going down. And last, theories of evolutionary mechanisms versus patterns of evolutionary realizations. On this planet, they're different things. They're obviously very related. It's the nomothetics of evolution, that is the principles, the timeless principles whereby it operates, and the narrative of evolution, which is what actually happened in this contingent world. It's law versus contingency. They're both very fascinating, but we mustn't think that we're ever going to understand all the narrative in terms of the law, because the theory, no matter how good we ever get it, has to underdetermine the actual pattern. That's just the nature of history. Now, there are certain systems in which you acknowledge that, but you're not interested in those little details. So the fact that theory might underdetermine whether the ball that I roll down this inclined plane might veer off because there's a scratch on it. I don't care about that. But the analogous contingent phenomenon in history we do care about because the, analog the analogous continue, uh, phenomenon in our history is, uh, hey, why did that object strike the Earth 65 million years ago and give mammals a chance and wipe out the dinosaurs and a bunch of other things. In other words, the, the, the level of our interest in the history of life is very much caught up in the contingent details that are necessarily underdetermined by the principles, no matter how well we know them. So there are going to be differences between the narrative character of contingent history. We want to know everything we can about the timeless laws and principles, but they, they will underdetermine the history, which we still have to study. Now, let me say where I think unification's good. 
Unification is great for certain things, particularly in overcoming the peculiar historical, I mean human historical, contingencies of subdisciplinary boundaries, which are set up for absurd reasons in the first place and certainly become irrelevant but entrenched later on. Botany and zoology, an obvious example, a division that usually makes little sense unless there's some political reason for maintaining it in certain places. Makes no intellectual sense. Genetics and paleontology used to be seen as opposite ends of some artificial spectrum. Now all sorts of studies are linking those two fields, what with genetic phylogenetics, genetics and embryology, two fields that would have always liked to have gotten together, I think, saw themselves closer, but just couldn't until, I totally agree with Ernst, the most exciting thing happening in evolutionary biology today is the rise and growth of so-called evo-devo, or studies of the evolution of development, and picking up much of phylogeny along the way. See, that's a real unification inspired by joint techniques and a coming together under the same principles. All right, now I, I come to the heart of what I want to do. I just want to give a few examples of what has caught at least my attention since 1982, a very short period of time, even, you know, even disciplinarily speaking. I make no claims this is in any way inclusive. I'm indulging myself. It's not an inclusive list of what's good or what's exciting in evolutionary theory since 1982, but it's not a random list either. Th that is, I will show my macroevolutionary and phylogenetic biases. Uh, none of us could help that. I will not have anything to say about ecology, mostly because it's the subject of several other talks here and partially out of my own ignorance but also because I don't yet see, I think that will be a major test. I do not yet see a whole lot of fruitful integration of macroevolutionary theory with a lot, macroecological theory with a lot of phylogenetics and microevolutionary theory. I hope it will come. I'm not going to say much about uh, the application of evolutionary theory to human behavior uh, because really that's material applicable only to one species, though one in which we take a legitimately strong parochial interest, I am not by any means so opposed to a concept of evolutionary psychology as some press reports might indicate. In fact, I think it's had some promising beginnings. Obviously, we all want an evolutionary psychology. My only objection is that much of the material that goes by that name right now as it's being practiced, although I think they have some things outstandingly right, like the modular organization of the brain, I think their current emphasis on almost exclusively trying to explain that material in terms of the putative adaptive value of whatever fundamental behaviors are discharged through those modules, plus the recognition that it's not in terms of what those behaviors are doing for us now, because they may be very inadaptive now, but what they did for us when we were hunter-gatherers on the African savanna, that may be right in theory, but it that is right in theory that you go back to the African savanna. I don't think it's right in theory that you should always be looking to the adaptive meaning of it. But the problem there is that you're then often stuck with the fairy tales of telling stories about material for which you cannot get evidence about small groups of hunter-gatherers a couple million years ago. This is a very difficult problem. We need an evolutionary psychology, and I think what they're doing now has a lot to teach us. I think it needs to be broadened. I'm going to talk about four areas instead. First, genetics and phylogeny. Then a little bit on Evo Devo. Third, life and earth. And then I do want to talk finally about the mi microcosm of experimental work. Uh, and this is 1982 versus now, a little tiny blip in our lives. Uh, genetics and phylogeny, what's happened between that and now, it really is remarkable because it's no secret. It's a result of what you can now do with gene sequencing and cladistic programming, etc. But I remember distinctly at 1982 and there, and then thinking, wouldn't it be wonderful, now we're beginning to get some genetic techniques, if we could ever figure out the interrelationships of the invertebrate phyla. I remember calling it the Holy Grail with my students, and I thought probably we wouldn't be able to do it, at least not for a long time, because first of all, it's likely that they all, diverge. this may not be so, but they may very well have all diverged within a short period of time which would be unresolvable by any of the whole comparison techniques like Sibley-Alquist 
that were being used at that time because you'd never pick up five or ten million years difference. It'd be within the limits of error of any technique. What I didn't realize at the time, I don't think most people didn't, is that, that the precision of our and, and, uh, and the amount of information that we could crunch would be such that you might actually be able to identify key synapomorphies. You wouldn't be, do it by whole genetic analysis. You'd be able to identify key synapomorphies that might group the phyla. Looks to me that, uh, although obviously this issue is not resolved, but it is fascinating that we do seem to have consistently coming up in studies a basic and rather sensible division, I might say, of the protostome phyla into the two groups, which lays to rest forever, if true, the cuviarian articulata and the joining of annelids and arthropods. I never think made much sense anyway. That is the grouping of the uh, molting phyla, the arthropods and others, and that second division, which also resolves the lophophorate phyla and separates the annelids, I think that's terrific. That's just wonderfully exciting and seems to be holding up. And I sure didn't expect that we'd get there this fast. I'm very excited about that. Secondly, on the issue of uh, prokaryotic phylogenies, of course, Wozzi's model was just coming in at that time. And now to think, here, Ernst, I may disagree, that... Uh, that you have this reasonably robust basic tree of life with its three domains. And to see, even if we knew from the Whitaker Five Kingdom system and others, that it was probably so. But to see a picture of the three multicellular kingdoms of plants, animals, and fungi as little twigs at the terminus of one of those three branch domains is somehow wonderfully... Uh, Humilify. It, it makes it gives us proper humility. It's not humiliating. It's exciting. <laughs> uh, even more important, I think, theoretically, I think Ford Doolittle is absolutely right about this, and and others. We haven't faced up or fessed up to it yet. But I hope everybody realizes that if lateral transfer is as common as it seems to be at the prokaryotic level, if it's actually bringing lots of genes across the three great branchings. You cannot apply the Linnaean system. You just can't. It's a logical question. It's not a, a factual one. The Linnaean system, the logic of the Linnaean system is a branching logic. There's nothing you can do about that. If lateral transfer is just a few percent of the gene, you say, okay, it's an exception. That's why we'll still be okay for multicellular creatures, I think. But I don't know what's going to happen to prokaryotic taxonomy if we ever honestly have to face up to that. The Linnaean logic cannot work with massive lateral transfer. It just plain can't. It's topology. It's logic. It's not empirics. Okay. Evo Devo. You know, my first book, as Bob mentioned, was on tajony and phylogeny in 1977. That wasn't exactly the uh, Paleocene, after all. I mean, it wasn't that long ago, 1977. But I remember writing that book, and I got to the end, and I was so frustrated, because I'd done this whole history from Heckel, from Pedicles, for that matter, on up. And I was right at the end when I would have been nice to have said something, and I couldn't say anything. Because clearly, in order to make the next step, one had to say something about the genetics of regulation. That was clear enough. We could read Britton and Davidson and others. But there was nothing that could be said. It was only 25 years ago, 23 years ago, there were no known regulatory genes because we still were stuck with electrophoretic techniques, which after all could only identify things that made proteins. So what do we know about regulators, except in some sense they had to be there. We have the Jacob Monod model for the lack of opera. We need something about regulation in prokaryotes, but we rightly also understood it wasn't going to work the same way in eukaryotes. I remember getting very excited by the paper of Alan Wilson and Mary Claire King on the 98 or 99% similarity between chimps and humans, and the inference that since the structural gene similarity is so great, the obviously substantial visual differences must be co caused by a small percentage of genes, and regulation must be behind a lot of it. Boy, to get that excited about something that's really only negative evidence shows where we weren't at that time. Now, if you think of what's happening now, it's just the mo I, I never would have believed it. And, What's happened has so much fit in with what I would have rooted for, but I wouldn't have dared hoped for. I guess if I had to summarize where I think all these exciting developments in Evo Devo are changing a fundamental view we used to hold about things, I would say we now appreciate, even through these early works, far more than we ever did how strongly the hand of history holds phylogeny 
and constrains its pathways, and I mean constraint in the positive sense of channeling and useful directions as much as I mean not allowing certain things. Homology among phyla is more than just bricks. Obviously, there's homology in the sense they all have DNA. That's enormously uninteresting. As, as I like to say, if uh, the only thing similar in two buildings on different continents of different cultures, they both use bricks, that's uninteresting. Uh, but if you start finding a Corinthian column with every, every acanthus leaf in place uh, in another continent, it's probably homology. <laughs> what all I'm saying is that we're beginning to find that level of detail in similarity and can make assertions about uh, deep homologies that I wouldn't have dreamed of in 1980, even though I think I rooted for it more than most folks at that time. I never would have dreamed it would have happened. Uh, uh, if I may quote Ernst one more time, uh, in his 1963 book, uh, citing a consensus at the time, I would have written the same, and I know Ernst would be the first to say, hey, <laughs> that was wrong, and we've learned some exciting things, but Ernst said, as, as anyone would have at that time, that it's probably not useful even to look for genetic homologies and detailed sequences between different phyla, because after all, this phyla have been separate for 500 million years or more, and we now know that natural selection is so powerful an editor that virtually every gene position would have been cycled through more than once. You're just not going to find them in principle, and that seemed like a perfectly reasonable argument, except they're there in abundance, as we now know. I Just to mention a couple things, which you all know, the homologizations between vertebrates and arthropods go on. Pair rule genes and segment polarity genes exist in zebrafish and amphioxus. I, I'm not saying, that, please, I, I don't want to go too far about this. Obviously, they're very different creatures, and most things aren't. I would, just with respect to the prediction that no genetic homology would be found at all of the, this complex variety, I think it's quite remarkable. But despite that, I find still most impressive in all that literature, the initial homologies that were found in the Hox gene sequences, when? Do you remember the shock of learning that there were Hox genes fourfold repeated in vertebrates with that degree of sequence similarity to the Hox genes of arthropods? I, I don't remember ever having been so stunned in my life in evolutionary biology, but then to find that in vertebrates, the anterior expression boundaries of most of them are not mapping to the somites of the vertebral column, but into the wonderfully forgotten rhombomeres of the segmentation of the mid and hind brain, which the 19th century German anatomists knew about and then everybody had conveniently forgotten. Now you could say, well, all that shows is that the homologies are not very important because after all, the rhombomeres disappear and only a few structures come out of that anyway, so you can't make detailed Hox gene homologies, but uh-uh, I don't think that's going to work either for a lot of reasons. First of all, a lot of things are influenced strongly by the rhombomeric segmentation, which is at least in part influenced by the Hox genes, the positions of cranial nerves, some of the structures up front. But the main point is paleontological, which I'm sure most of you realize, and that is the earliest agnathan vertebrates. It's true that we don't do much with that rhombomeric segmentation and its sequelae, but the first vertebrates, the agnathan fishes, have this massive branchial basket, which is not only a breathing device, but a feeding device. In fact, those first fishes may have fed in an arthropod manner by bringing food from the back end up through the branchial basket to the mouth with no bones surrounding it. You look at those first vertebrates, most of them are, the, the rhombomeres, which are linked to the branchial arches, most of those original vertebrates are that part, the vertebral column's a little bit tacked on behind. So that, in fact, at least at the origin of the first vertebrates we know, most of that body probably is homologizable to the segmentation of arthropods. I never would have believed that. The second thing that's excited me most, and I suppose the Pax 6 story of eyes is still the best example, is the extent of parallelism behind what used to be the poster boy examples of pure convergence. After all, I grew up with the notion that if you wanted one grand example of the power of natural selection, given limits of workable design, to produce from utterly different starting points effectively the same structure, over and over again, it was the eye of, of cephalopods and vertebrates, so similar in, in function, but obviously not homologous anatomically. They're made from different body tissues. Then, of course, you have the eye of arthropods, which is different altogether. But that was the poster boy example. 
of convergence. And of course, it's right insofar as it goes. The eyes are not anatomically homologous. Obviously, they're not. But who would have, at least I would not have dreamed 10 years ago that there could be seriously interesting homologies of genetic pathways upon which different systems then are used to build these similar eyes. I, I wouldn't have thought that likely or possible, and yet uh, we know that um, the human gene can p ectopically express on a Drosophila leg makes an arthropod eye, as does squid pack six as well. And so many of our poster boy examples of convergences, the supposed examples of the pure power of natural selection, needing no boost from the hand of history, in fact have enormous boosts from the hand of history in the homology of the underlying genetic pathways, not the homology of the anatomical structures. That's really stunning. Let me tell you one interesting historical fact. Do you know, you all know that E. Ray Lancaster invented the term homoplasy. Do you know that he uh, developed it as a subcategory of homology initially? Now that sounds bizarre because homoplasy is its opposite now, but he did. Uh, this is a very complicated story I have no time for about how it transmuted into its current meaning of the non-homologous stuff. But you see, that's what Lancaster had in mind. There are hard homologies, which are the anatomical homologies of the products, but then Lancaster realized there was another set of things which are clearly not homologous as overt adult anatomies, but which he thought has to be produced by the fact that after all, when two lineages separate, they're still holding a lot of their genes in common, and if use that terminology, they have genetic determinants in common, and if, and they, they represent a homology of underlying builders of things, and that's parallelism, of course. That's the classical distinction of parallelism and convergence. Today we put parallelism and convergence together as homoplasy, oppose it to homology, but parallelism is that funny category in between, where you have non-homology of what ends of the final anatomy, but you have homology of the underlying generators. And that's why, that's why Lancaster set it up, I think, conceptually correctly. And so I, I don't mean to keep citing you, it's just you are such a giant in the field, I can't uh, say anything without realizing that you said it before. But Ants actually, I think, very smartly in a recent paper, included parallelism within homology, rather than usually for that reason, as its opposite. And I think that's right. And so to me, that's just stunning. Third category. Hey, this is a better time talk than I talk. I'm actually going to finish on time. Terrific. Life and the Earth. Um, one of the problems that paleontology has traditionally had with Darwin's own point of view is that Darwin, as such a strong follower of, of Lyellian uniformity of race, was very much committed to trying to explain just about as much as he possibly could by slow and steady transformation, which is why he was very nervous about mass extinctions and really hoped that they could be explained by deficiencies of the fossil record, admittedly, yeah, a little bit faster then, but not really fast, which he knew was a threat to his explanatory preferences. But uh, in 1980, of course, the first paper of Alvarez, of, the Al of Alvarez's father and son came out, widely hooted down by most paleontologists then. So in 1982, it was a very live debate, and uh, the notion of truly catastrophic mass extinction was still wildly heretical in this world of ours. Now it's virtually a fact for the Cretaceous extinction. We don't have a general theory of mass extinctions. So that's just one example of, a, of something we have learned. It has been validated with enormous implications for how we think of the history of life and its causal basis. Then I think I see Doug Irwin out here has done a lot of this work. Just the fine tuning and learning about the details of that exciting time at the base of the Cambrian. What have we learned recently? That the Ediacara fauna, which 20 years ago we thought died out long before the Cambrian explosion, did not. It goes right up to the base of the Cambrian explosion. And those stunning embryos that Xu Hai Zhao and Andy Knoll published on last year probable metazoan embryos back in the heart of Ediacara at 580 million years, and it begins to look as though that pattern leading up to this grandest event of the Cambrian explosion is much more like other ones than we thought. Namely, that incumbency is powerful, the metazoa may have been there for a long time, probably more by the trace fossils, as well as the embryos don't displace Ediacara, whatever that point is. Ediacara dies out, presumably by some mass extinction, and incumbency is destroyed, and the metazoa get their chance. It begins to look like mammals waiting in the wings for 100 million years, 
well, dinosaurs prevailed. So we, we, that's a good case where you begin to see general pattern by looking at repetitions in the narrative histories. Very interesting kind of unification. Th those are my candidates. Oh, oh, sorry, number four, the microcosm of experimental work. I won't get, yeah. The microcosm of experimental work. I mean, there's some wonderful stuff going on. Lenski and the various other programs on bacterial. You know, paleontologists are really jealous of Lenski and his colleagues, the other folks who work on bacterial evolution, because they have a paleontological system in real time. They have, I, I talked to Rich, he's up to 25,000 generations. The last published paper I read was 10 or 15,000. And you can see the most amazing things, such as you do get repeated patterns, cell size increases, probably for adaptive reasons, but along very different pathways in a punctuational manner each time. But for me, even more exciting, he can do paleontology because he saves the generations along the way. So he can take generation 20,000, revive generation 10,000, and compete the two. <laughs> to see. That, that's what I want to do. I want to bring those dinosaurs back, despite its impossibility in Jurassic, and see what is going to happen if I compete them against mammals. He can do it. Stunning stuff. I mean, I'm really jealous. All right, they're bacteria. <laughs> they don't look like much. <laughs> hey, I like bacteria. That's what I said in Full House. Anyway, I got a little live up to it. What about artificial life and other? modeling schemes, I, I don't know what that's going to teach us. I think it teaches us much more uh, about abstract systems simpler than the real world than anything about life itself, but we need to know that. And then there's this wonderful panoply of studies that, uh, that just excite me every time I read one, brilliant, well-documented studies of small-scale microevolution well-affirmed in controlled situations over 10 to 50 years. But there is a paradox there. Every time someone publishes a case like that, the press says, ah, you see, you said evolution really doesn't happen, but it's such a slow process. But here, you can see a little bit of it in 20 years. Everybody says, see, Darwin must have been right. This little bit happens in 20 years. That proves that over millions of years. You know, did you ever make the calculations? There's a paradox there. I call it the paradox of the visibly irrelevant. If you can see it changing at all, it's too fast to have anything to do with anagenetic trends. Now, what it may be, I mean, after all, if you have an anagenetic trend from here to here, it doesn't go like that. It goes, I mean, all you're seeing is a, is, a, is a little bit of the jiggle, but you can't. If you extrapolate any rate you can see, it is so vastly too fast with respect to anything that's a phylogenetic trend in the record. It just can't be the same stuff. It's got to be the jiggling, which makes the trend something else, which is itself an interesting question. Uh, George Williams did a wonderful calculation in his last book. He got excited by the fact that since the sparrow, English sparrow came to North America in the 1850s, in 100 years, leg length bones have increased by about 5% in some populations. So small, and that's a lot smaller than these 20-year studies of things you can publish, so small that even a, the best bird watcher spending his whole life watching the thing, I said, hey, I think they look a little bigger, but I'm not sure. Even that degree is sufficient to change a sparrow bone into an ostrich bone and back 55 times in a million years. <laughs> I mean, if you can see it, it's not relevant to the trends of macroevolution. It's something else, but it sure is interesting. OK. So what does all this say about evolutionary theory in the broad sense? 1959, uh, 1982 versus now. The thing about strict Darwinism and its time of greatest prevalence of the 1959 centenary celebrations. And in Darwin's formulation is a brilliant thing. You put aside the complexities you can't deal with in strict, the strict form of Darwinism, where effectively everything is explained by natural selection on organisms, where the role of inside factors is set aside because you say all there is coming from the inside is, is isotropic raw material, it's variation which occurs in all directions, doesn't supply direction, directing force is natural selection, the internal stuff's only raw material, then you don't have to deal with it as Darwin couldn't, but you do have to deal with it. That's what all the Evo Devo stuff is about. And the role of the outside is to set a stage whose rates of alteration are such that natural selection is being controlled. It is very dangerous to that notion if you have catastrophic mass extinction, which is just going to wipe things out for reasons that have nothing to do with why those 
bits of anatomy arose by natural selection in normal times. Well, I think if we know anything now is there's a lot coming from the inside that's directional. There's a lot happening on the outside that is not at the tempo that will allow the strict form of extrapolative Darwinian selection simply on organisms to work. It's a wonderful theory. It will remain the core of our evolutionary theory that I'm confident of, but a lot more is going to happen. Uh, if I could just give a quick prognosis, I, I don't think this is going to be old hat because I don't feel that differently about this part of it than I have for a long time. I think the first response of many folks, and I think Ants was absolutely right about that again this morning when he said it's uh, antiquated or superannuated, was to try and be even more reductionist than Darwin. If Darwin said it was the organism, maybe he was wrong, it was the gene. And I, I agree, it just isn't. That's fundamentally confusing bookkeeping with causality. You do your bookkeeping in terms of genes for very good reasons. Causality is another matter. At this point, I just have to stop for a moment and mourn with you the death of our colleague and brother in research, Bill Hamilton, who got so much of this started in the most interesting ways. Shouldn't happen, but it's a contingent world. So. Bookkeeping at the gene level, sure, but causality, the theory of natural selection, Sober and, and David Stone Wilson are right about that. That's why collaborations between philosophers and scientists can be very powerful. Philosophers are really good. I think what I learned from Elizabeth Lloyd, the two papers I wrote about the same subject, is, has just helped me immensely. That's another good example of confluence. But natural selection is a theory about interactives. It's not a theory about replicators. It's a theory about entities, Darwinian individuals out there that interact with their environment. And selection is differential reproductive success conferred by the fitness of having certain properties. And there are lots of Darwinian interactives out there. Genes can be in certain circumstances. Organisms are most of the time. That's why Darwin focused on them. But deems can be, as, as Wilson and... Uh, and Sober show very convincingly, species can be even clades in limited circumstances. They can all be interactives. And the point is the logic of this developing hierarchical dar theory, hierarchical selection theory, this expanded Darwinism, if you will, it's not just a little different from the unifocal Darwinism of one level selection on organs, with an occasional exception for things like altruism. Uh, this is a thoroughgoing full-scale hierarchical theory. Just two quick things. Stabilities, which in the strict Darwinian one-level theory are optimalities, stabilities are often balances between levels of selection, to negative interaction. That goes back to the, to the Orgel and Crick hypothesis, whether it's right or not, just an example, that middle repetitive DNA may be a balance between positive gene level selection suppressed by negative organismic level. Don't know whether that's right or not, but I think examples like that are going to abound of stabilities caused by negative interaction of selection at levels. Secondly, macroevolution really has to be, if, if punctual equilibrium has any legacy, I think this will be it. It's the recasting of macroevolution as largely the story of the differential success of species treated as legitimate Darwinian individuals, because not much happens in the life of most species. And so macroevolution is a differential pattern of speciation through time. That's how you have to ask most macroevolutionary questions. I'll tell you one anecdote. I was giving a talk actually here in Washington this weekend, and a non-biologist, a doctor in fact, very interested in this stuff, came up to me and he said, I don't understand it. They just found these advanced Homo erectus tools. Now, Homo erectus is our ancestor. How could Homo erectus not have developed uh, representational art and other forms of what we call human stuff if it was there for so long and eventually turned into us. And I, you know, I talked to him for a long time, I couldn't get through, and I finally realized he's got to think about it in a different way. And I said, you know, you're not thinking about it right. Homo erectus isn't this entity that slowly and surely marched its way to us. Because if it was, then you have a good point. Why did it stay around so long and why is it such a quick introduction of cave art? So I said, don't think of it that way. Homo erectus is our ancestor, but it's a different thing. It's an entity. It's a biological entity, whatever anagenesis occurred within it. Homo sapiens is a branching event off it. It's a different thing in the world of macroevolution, and that makes sense of the pattern you've seen. I think that's right. Uh, okay, we're coming to the end of this. Um, ah, yeah. So that's the, the, the point number one. Point number two, the hand of... Uh, I was talking about... Uh, the logic of multi-level selection. The second main thing they're going to have to incorporate into the larger evolutionary theory is this whole business of the hand of history I've been talking about. What are the implications of that kind of interior directing? 
That's why the folks who are talking about evolution of evolvability are on the right track. They really are. Uh, because you only ask those questions when it isn't any longer a plastic world where everything changes under the influence of external pushes of natural selection. It is about what breaks the hand, and the evolution of evolvability is enormously important. And evolvability occurs in levels, and what I like to call the exaptive pool, which is the stuff out there, the redundancies, the stuff being used for something else or not at all that is co-optable, that's probably, fundamentally, it's not that it's, it's good because natural selection makes it work so well, it's, because, it's good because it has a big exaptive pool of things can be utilized in other ways, who knows how. That's a different way to think about it. And theory will underdetermine pattern. Even when we build all that, we're still going to have to trace narrative because many questions that are vital to us, as I said, it's not the scratches on the inclined plane. Many questions that are vital to us are in the realm of narrative underdetermined by theory. <laughs> Why are we all here as one recent species with so little genetic difference among our geographic groups or so-called races? That's a contingency of the recent origin of Homo sapiens and the recent spread. That's not a predictability from principles of Darwinian theory. Could have been different, and it would have been a very different world with different moral dilemmas. Why did mammals prevail? That question demands, among other things, such narrative data as the thing that struck the Earth 65 million years ago. Um, there may be a ratchet of predictability for levels of complexity. That's the only argument I can think of that might be valid in terms of predictability for complexity. But it doesn't have to happen. It's occurring on a contingent world. Why did the Permian extinction wipe out 95 and not 100%? Could have wiped out 100%. We wouldn't be able to talk about it. Why didn't this Earth go the way of Mars? Did life help prevent that? That's what if there's anything to Gaia, which I doubt, that's what it's about. Um, footnote of humility, then I come to my final point. For all the excitement of this stuff, uh, if you ever want to get too excited, here's the blast through the hubris. If you really want to ask Schrodinger's question, what is life, we're hopelessly unable to deal with it because we only have one experiment. All this stuff is about one experiment, that one origin of life here on Earth. So we can't even know what commonalities mean. What does it mean that we're all DNA, that you can only do it that way, or that that's just the way it happened to here? It, we can't get any answer to that. The Drake equation isn't an equation. We have no idea from pseudo-probabilities whether there's other life out there. We, it, it's logically impossible, because the fact that life exists here is consistent with both extreme alternatives. Either life exists here because we expect it to exist on all the gazillions of planets, or Life only exists here, and we happen to have taken a positive sample in the one place we can. <laughs> so, it's, it's, again, it's a logical issue. We need a replicate. We've got to have replicates. We've got to make it here or find it elsewhere. Okay, last point. Evolution is about continuity. I, I sometimes, I suppose this is a sign of advancing age, but uh, luckily time has run out, so I wasn't going to give that sermon I was going to give on uh, why sharp debate is terrific, but uh, ad hominem attacks are really awful. Uh, I would like to put us in a middle state between the field of literature, where people murder each other with apparent delight, and the irenicism. I don't know how many of you know jazz musicians or classical performers. Everything that any of their colleagues do is great. <laughs> they never criticize each other. I think they understand that they dare not. It is such a hard world to be in, and there's so few people who can get there, and if you end up killing each other off, that we don't want, quite want that, but we, we do not want to be like literature people, and too often we are. He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. Book of Proverbs, that's where the title of that play came from. Evolution is continuity, that it's that's the glory of it all. We are here as heirs at the new millennium of a wondrous continuity in the history of Western science. And I thought I'd just end by some show and tell. Uh, this is the millennium transition. Let's look at each hundred years since 1500 and say a little bit about the build-up of this wonderful storehouse of knowledge. My items here from my book collection are influenced by my interest in paleontology. Let's go back to 1500. Here's the oldest book I own, 1494. In fact, I know the exact date it was published because it says it was published on, in Venice on June 22, 1495. 
and it says at the beginning, Alberti Magni Philosophorum Maximi de Mineralibus Liber Primus and keep it. The beginning of the first book of the mineralogy of Albertus Magnus, the greatest philosopher. This is the mineralogical treatise of Albert the Great, the teacher of Thomas Aquinas, the greatest scholar of medieval times with respect to natural history, 13th century. In the early history of printing, his work reprinted many times. The few good insights that come from that period about the nature of fossils are, are in Albert's De Mineralibus here. Let's go up 100 years. This is where I'm, I'm going to stay within 10 years of century boundaries. That's my game here. This is 1596. This is De Metallicis on metals of Cesalpino, one of the early Italian geologists, the best of treatise on classification of rocks, minerals, and fossils with a clear recognition of the organic nature thereof. That debate goes on, and it will not be settled until that change comes about in the late 17th century, which we call modern science. Here's the last gasp of the old view that fossils may not be organic. Very interesting example. You may know the story. In 1696, a substantial number of bones of a, of a mammoth were found near Gotha in Germany. The, uh, the folks of the medical college in Gotha uh, put out this pamphlet in 1696 claiming that they could not be organic, that they were so-called so unicornu fossile, or fossil unicorn, which was a name given for what were taken to be non-organic things that looked like unicorn horns. A response was written by an Italian geologist the very next year, showing quite conclusively that they were indeed. Uh, I'm happy to show this to anyone. This is the personal copy of J.F. Blumenbach a century later, a half a century later, the man, the great German scientist who, who developed the modern racial classification from a non-racist standpoint of modern humans, his wonderful series of notes on these pamphlets in the early history of paleontology. That's 1700. You go up to 1800, and now we have... I don't have a chance to show you this one, but this is Charles Dickens' copy of Owen's monograph on the gorilla. I was going to say something about unification of disciplines. But in the moment, it's, it's, hanging, it's handling my two, uh, my two examples for 1800. This is one of Lavoisier. Lavoisier published one geological paper in 1794. It is one of the most brilliant papers ever written on the proper way to interpret stratigraphic sequences in environmental terms. He had plans to publish a lot of other geology. Eight months later, he appeared on the Place de la Concorde under the guillotine, three months before the fall of Robespierre and the end of the Terror. But he published this one geological paper. This is the original proof plate. I have the set of them. And here written in his own hand, Bon à tirer après les corrections. You may print it after the correction, signed Lavoisier. Everybody has their heroes. Darwin's our hero, my hero. But uh, Lavoisier is my second hero. It is something about the stunning, chilling clarity of that man's prose. If you ever want to read great scientific writing and what happened to him, though he was not executed for anything he did in science, but for his role as a tax collector, unfairly, I might say, is somehow a lesson to us all. On the other side of 1800, <laughs> on the other side of 1800, the, the first volume of Lamarck's Philosophie Zoologique, spanning, and now we're into evolutionary theory. I'm going to cheat for 1900, though this is 1904, the first thing I showed you, because here's a symbol and an actuality. This is probably the most wonderful thing I own in terms of something that's heart stopping. I bought it for almost nothing. Um, nobody saw its value. Uh, this is a book, it's. Um, it's one of five volumes of the great poem by Torquato Tasso, Jerusalemme Liberata, uh, all about those horrible heathens and the great crusaders. But here's the point. A lot of inscriptions on the first page. This is about continuity. First inscription, obviously much older than the second. T.H. Huxley, a birthday and parting gift in remembrance of three dear friends, May 4th, 1849. This was given to Thomas Henry Huxley by the woman he married, whom he met in Sydney, he left her there. She came over a couple of years later. You know the story. It's, this is what they gave to Huxley. There's no evidence he ever read it. He apparently wanted to learn Italian. They gave him the, the, the five volumes, wrote that inscription. Uh, it was from Nellie Heathorne, whom he married, her sister and her brother-in-law. Uh, the second inscription, which almost brings me to tears when I read it, uh, 28th July, 1911, Hodesley, Eastbourne, to Julian Sorrell Huxley from his grandmother, Henrietta Ann Huxley, nay Heathorne, Grand Moo in remembrance. That's just so beautiful. She comes over, she marries Thomas Henry Huxley. Sixty years later, she takes out the book in her faltering hand, 
and writes as the grandmother of Julian Huxley, passing it along. That's continuity. That's what science is about. That's what evolution is about. And while I'm preaching, the last thing, my copy of Albertus here happens to be bound in a, that's nothing, in a page from Medieval Gradual, which says, it's a statement to Solomon, who holds wisdom. It says, Davide Dominus Deus, Sedum David Patris Eus. It says, and the Lord God gave to him the seed of David his father, as Regnabit in Domo Jacob in Eternum, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Now that's, that's the statement of continuity. Solomon, the embodiment of wisdom, who shall reign over the growth of wisdom forever. I don't want to get too soppy. But that's the legacy we have, and we've got to carry it forward. Thank you.